Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's LinkedIn Live. I'm uh, really happy to have uh, Jordan Racky, who's the CEO and board member at Key Factor, uh, as our guest today. Uh, so full disclosure, uh, I've worked with Jordan um, since 2014 and couldn't be happier for his successor to have him here today. Uh, so Key Factor is an identity first security solution for enterprises that helps to secure and orchestrate every digital key and certificate from multi-cloud operations to embedded IoT devices. We'll talk more about what that means in a bit, uh, and also about the tremendous success that the company's had. So first, congratulations, Jordan. Uh, you announced last week that Key Factor uh, got a significant infusion of capital from Sixth Street Growth, and they're uh, the growth investing platform of Sixth Street. But importantly, it increased your company's enterprise valuation to approximately 1.3 billion, uh, which is a really remarkable rise from its 2019 valuation of 100 million. Great, thank you. I'm I'm excited to be here, Karen. And I've, like you had mentioned, we've known each other for a long time. So um, excited to do this uh, interview, and hopefully, I could bring some I don't know some insight to those that are attending. Terrific. Well, I look forward to learning uh, and having our audience learn more about both the company uh, and about you as a leader. So you have this, this wonderful new infusion of capital. How do you plan to utilize the funds from this infusion to advance the company's objectives? Yeah, thank you. Still working through that. Uh, we've got mm -hmm. our kind of Q4 board meeting coming up in two weeks, and we have a new makeup with two new board members from Sixth Street uh, and compliments of... Uh, Insight Partners, who's still our majority uh, investor, and then myself and Ted Schroeder, who's our CTO and co-founder, mm -hmm. uh, that collectively we make up the board, including a, another gentleman, Tim Harvey. So it's a new uh, kind of recipe, and, and we'll uh, talk through, you know, with the new capital that we have, how we're going to put it to use, but we certainly will. And uh, I'm excited about, you know, the market opportunity for what Key Factor is addressing. And uh, yeah, so TBD a little bit, but we'll have a lot of clarity in the next like three weeks or so. Terrific. Well, I, I'd say a good good issue to have to discuss at the board meetings. Terrific. Yeah. For, so for people who don't speak identity security, can you give a real life example of what it is that Key Factor does? Yeah, absolutely. So we support two sides of the house for large enterprises, whether you're securing kind of your enterprise network and everything that's uh, mm -hmm. being managed by your organization in terms of endpoints like devices, machines, workloads, APIs, essentially everything that's not a human that's connected mm -hmm. or sharing or accessing information still has to have its own identity. So we issue identities into millions across these enterprises, and then we help them manage them through lifecycle management around renewing, revoking, refreshing certificates. So that's one side of what we do is is, is helping the largest banks in the world, the largest telecoms, make sure that they have a you know fully secure environment that's way beyond just securing like human identities. So again, machine identities or non-human identities is what we focus on. And then on the other side, we uh, attack uh, product security teams in terms of supporting them to achieve secure things that they manufacture and take to market, whether it's the largest phone manufacturers in the world or the largest medical device manufacturers or vehicles or high speed train systems, you know, all of these things that maybe you take to the market in a consumer fashion or even to another business. When you are on the assembly line and you're developing that technology, you know, that 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 piece of technology, for example, has its own cryptographic identity. And so our technology allows these enterprises or manufacturers to issue identities to them when they come off the manufacturing line so that if you have to do like a software or firmware update uh it's done in a in a highly secure fashion so mm -hmm. that's without saying the names of our customers that's that's what we do yeah so for example you might embed in a pacemaker or some medical right. device uh and you want of course for your whoever the provider is for that to be able to securely connect or my car, yeah. whenever it, it connects back with right. Volvo, we want to make sure that it's Volvo it's connecting with and not some third party. Right. Or a charging yeah. station. If you have an electric mm -hmm. vehicle, that connection between the charging station and your vehicle, just making sure that the charging station is who it says it is. The vehicle mm -hmm. is who it says it is. And that's done through identification. And that's what we issue is these IDs. And then like a pacemaker example is a great one, right? You, you get a pacemaker put in, 
you know, if you need to do a software update to the pacemaker, you don't want to have to take the pacemaker out to do that. You want to be able to do it securely over the waves. And, and so we allow for that to, to, to take place. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a uh, key factor is probably in our lives in many ways uh, that we yeah. don't even know about, right. For, yeah. for just the average great, Dane and John Doe out here. Yeah, we, you know, one of the stories we tell is like, if you're going to the airport on a business trip, you know, the interaction from leaving your house, you know, to booking an appointment, to getting on the plane, to logging into Wi-Fi, to ordering a, a vehicle when you land, to, you know, interacting with your hotel app. Every single one of those points requires ad identification to happen first before mm -hmm. an exchange of information and access of information. And all that's done with certificates, digital certificates, as, and keys and certificates. And those are all, uh, you know, for a lot of those larger enterprises that are out there, issued and managed by Key Factor. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, you've talked about the current growth path at Key Factor to an F1 race, which I think is a really wonderful analogy. So maybe you could you could talk a little bit about why you think it's like an F1 race. Well, I mean, I, I, when we look at kind of the investments we're making in R and D and and what we're doing organizationally to make sure we stay out in front of the innovation curve relative to our competition, one of the things that I always talk to our head of technology about is you know, we want to make sure, you know, first of all, we, we are and have been in pole position in this space for some time now. We we were a startup for a while. We were kind of taking on the market. We've now become market leader, um, but we don't want to be satisfied there. So just because we're out in front, the conversation I have with my team is we still want to make sure we're having the fastest laps on the track. And we still want to make sure that we're not allowing our competition to close the gap. And so every time we're going through like budgeting cycles and talking about what we're going to do, like as we go into 2024, you know, when we look at kind of our R and D roadmap and what we're trying to achieve, uh, it is very much, you know, compared to things, you know, like a race or something where we just want to make sure we're widening that gap. And that allows us to go capture market share at a faster rate than our competitors. And so it's just one of the analogies. I mean, I, I've, I think many people have probably latched on to F1 when they watched the drive to survive series on Netflix exactly. and, and yeah. that was, that was a cool one. So I, so now I'm, I went to my first F1 race two weeks ago, went to the F1 race in Austin at Coda, which was really cool. Um, but I don't want to over index on, on that, but that that's just one of the many, you know, things that we discuss. And, you know, the most important part is that we don't want to rest on our laurels and we don't want to be a business that's only focused on sales and marketing or only focused on R and D. You know, we are a company that has a very balanced strategy to our uh, growth, right? We're not product led. We're not sales led. We really are a balanced, you know, business with proper investments across the board to make sure that we, you know, have a very sturdy foundation and infrastructure as an organization. Yeah. Well, I love that coming from a, a former successful CRO moving into the CEO slot that because sales is typically a, a central focus for many companies and yet you have it as just part of the ecosystem. You just, how do you, what are the benefits for the organization is that, and how do you, how do you keep the balance of all those different parts? Like the balance of what investments, sorry. Yeah. The, of investments and making sure that, that sales, for example, or technology would yeah. be another option. Isn't, isn't, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I you're not maximizing any of those you're optimizing for the whole. Yeah. I mean, I think you just have to look at, you know, where your current strengths are and where it is relative to the market and where's the market going and making sure that, you know, you've only got a finite amount of resources in terms of spend. And you have to just make sure that, you know, maybe one year it over indexes on sales and marketing a little bit, but then you'll see an influx of customers that require you make sizable increases in your spend on the, uh, on the customer side. And I'm not saying we're reactive and that we do one, not thinking the other will come, but you know, it ebbs and flows a little bit yeah. and who gets a little bit more budget going into the coming year, which again, budget negotiations are always a fun time of the year. So we're, we're in the heat of that right now over the next two weeks as we get prepared for this board meeting. Yeah, that's great. All right. Well, something that might benefit from an analogy, but I don't have one post quantum cryptography yeah. migration. I'm going to say that 10 times fast close post-quantum cryptography migration is a critical topic for cybersecurity. Can you explain br briefly and for lay people what that means and how you're addressing the challenge and um, how you're helping organizations plan ahead for the quantum sure. computing era? Yeah. So generative AI has, has been all the buzz and, and I think rightfully so for a lot of mm -hmm. uh, companies and kind of 
mainstream media, but I would say for security personnel, you know, quantum is, is on the front page as well and getting prepared for quantum. And so, you know, the idea of quantum computing is, is a completely different way, longer algorithms for, you know, people to compute, for people to break uh, information, to leverage quantum computers, to hack mm -hmm. into systems. And so while quantum is maybe five, 10 years from now in terms of the viability of the breaking to happen, you know, organizations like the NSA and NIST and others are already mandating that companies be prepared in a quantum resilient, mm -hmm. quantum ready fashion starting next year. There's algorithms that are getting approved at the beginning of next year. So a lot of our customers are thinking critically about how do they transform the identities of the assets in their enterprise or the assets that they're taking mm -hmm. to market through IoT manufacturing so that those algorithms are long enough and written in a way that are quantum resilient to, to make sure that an attack from a quantum computer essentially couldn't hack into your environments. And that that's a really uh, a very real thing that our customers are facing today mm -hmm. in terms of preparing for that. And we're at the forefront of that. I mean, if you think about our technology, we discover and find all of your identities across your enterprise. So we find the vulnerable places, we find the places that might you know, be mo more vulnerable to attacks. And we work with them now on thinking through a quantum ready strategy so they can go ahead and start shifting starting next year, mm -hmm. replacing uh, certain algorithms with quantum resilient ones. And that's just a, a huge resiliency strategy for our customers, the ones that Right now, it's mostly in like Fed and like public sector. Also, those that sell uh, to the Fed and public sector, whether it's mm -hmm. hardware or software, large banking institutions. But what we found historically in cyber is that that's you know very often where it starts, and then it starts you know from a technology adoption curve or just like a, a mindset and an operational adoption. It will trickle down throughout the rest of you know large enterprises and even mid enterprises over the next couple of years. So I. I really see this quantum resilient proofing effort starting now. And I think it's really going to hit a height and, and a spike in demand, a sustained spike. But, but we'll see, you know, the majority of companies really starting to make that transformation over the next 24 months or so, 24, okay. 36 months. Yeah. So something we would put in the important, not yet urgent category. Uh, but I think smart companies like to uh, need to spend time um, yeah. in in that category before things yeah. get urgent and you have yeah. to be I would say it's, it's so important though that you don't want to get to a point where it's urgent and you haven't right. been planning for it. So I think, you know, a lot of companies are already planning. Migrations are starting next year. And I think, you know, in 2025 is the best interest for most all companies to really have that that plan. Be ready. Because yeah. you know, we're working with the largest companies in the world and they can't like flip a switch and change their entire strategy mm -hmm. in one day. So there's a lot of crawl walk running and and planning and iterative, you know, improvements. And, and that really needs to start now. So. All right. So heads up to anybody who has not yet uh, taken a look at that. You also just released a new research report called um, Digital Trust in a Connected World, Navigating the IoT Security Challenges. Can you talk a little bit about the key findings that you had covered in that report? So, I mean, a lot of the findings was that the gaps between the current status quo or the historical status quo of enterprise security is continuing mm -hmm. to widen. I mean, we find that 80% plus of our buyers were actually using a homegrown proprietarily built, you know, piecing it together with Excel and stuff. And that was working, you know, for some time, but as organizations become more modern, as organizations move to like multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, multi-public cloud, like with Azure and AWS, et cetera, mm -hmm as digital transformations transpire, the gap between what was working and the status quo and like where the company is going is continually widening. And so these companies are having to make compromised decisions. They're either, you know, the security teams either allowing the company to, if they haven't purchased us or, you know, a viable competitor to us or something, you know, what's happening is the security team is either letting the developers and the rest of the organization transform and move and not slow them down and it's creating massive security exposure gaps and, and potential sizable outages that could be financially impactful, or they're just telling everyone else they need to slow down and your security team is actually becoming a bottleneck to the strategic growth that you're trying to, to take on. So, you know, I think the biggest takeaway is that gap is just widening at, at paces that's never been seen before. So, you know, we feel, you know, very good about where we're at in the market, given that we do believe that it's 80% plus 
you know, blue ocean, greenfield mm. organizations that have been trying to do it themselves. But, you know, the, the idea of like, this is like a vitamin and like, this is something that's pre pre a preventative solution is really moving from that to more of like a painkiller. And the idea that, you know, pain is really starting to be found in, in the mm. pain of customers and the pain of prospects that we talk to, not customers, because once they're a customer, you know, they don't have these issues, but the pain for prospects is, yeah. is, is stronger than ever right now. And, and unfortunately a lot of companies don't move until they are feeling the pain, but you know, we, we are, are, uh, well positioned right now to support them. And, and I, yeah, to answer your question, that was one of the biggest takeaways is that the gap is just the gap. wider than ever before in terms of what they have and how it can support where the company's going. And so people need to move quickly to address that. Yeah. Great. Um, we'll put a link to that in the notes underneath this interview for anyone who's, who's watching later or wants to come back and, and click into that. So Jordan, let's pivot just a little bit. I want to talk about leadership and you are a first time CEO. I'd love if you would share a bit about what led you to transition from the CRO role to the CEO role and how you were selected for this role by Insight Partners. Yeah, thank you. So, I mean, the, the backstory there is that I, yeah, I, I came up through sales. I was an SDR originally, which was really fun being on the front lines. I moved to a rep, I moved to sales leadership. I moved to CRO where I oversaw sales and marketing and kind of go to market operations. And then I was just at a board meeting with our chairman, who's the same chairman of my prior company where I was a CRO. And after the board meeting, he just pulled me inside and said, Hey, listen, we just invested in this business key factor. It's got a great product market fit, great technology. And I think, you know, your skill set around designing a kind of global go to market and distribution network would be extremely complimentary. And so that's where it came from. It, I, you know, I, I guess in the back of my head, I always thought I, I, I could be and would want to be a CEO, but, you know, I'll give my chairman, Mike Triplett from, from Insight Partners, a lot of credit. He's the one that kind of pushed me in this direction and, you know, I couldn't be more thrilled about it. So I've, I've enjoyed the, the transformation. I, well, my background is in sales. I really work hard to make sure mm -hmm. that everyone in our company understands that I look at things extremely holistically and objectively. And it's not, like I said earlier, we're not a sales led culture. We're, you know, very balanced business. And we have a, a strong belief that, you know, we can't just rest on the R and D that's got us to where we're at. We have to continue to invest and have the most disruptive technology on the market, the, the products that, you know, will continue to deliver results for our customers, not just today, but five years from now, 10 years from now. And so, yeah, I mean, I've really enjoyed it. I mean, I, I'm a, I'm, I'm big into organizational culture. We, we care mm -hmm. about every single person in the business. We really believe in like a bi-directional kind of value chain between employee and employer. You know, we've won a lot of, a lot of cultural awards, which those are just awards. I mean, they're great and all, but at the end of the day, like you just got to enjoy the journey and you got to enjoy the people mm -hmm. you work with and have, have a good time kind of, you know, grow in a company and the, at the pace that we're growing it. And at the pace we're growing, there's going to be challenges and, you know, you got to be agile and you've got to be able to adapt. And so, you know, a great culture is the difference in bending and breaking, I'd say, you know, as the organization is going through the growth we're going through while, you know, facing all of the kind of external headwinds, right? I mean, I, I took over the business in the middle of 2019 and, you know, six months later, COVID hit, and then we hit like inflationary times. And, you know, now, unfortunately, you know, there's been multiple wars that have broken out across the world. So there's a lot of, you know, challenges right now out there. And so, you know, we're just so heavily committed to providing a great opportunity and experience for our, our, our team, but we also expect a lot, a lot out of them as well. So it's, it's a good, good balance. And, you know, we're a team of adults. So we like to say that we care about everybody, but we don't coddle anybody. So, you know, we've got work to do. And, and so that's a big focus for us as a company. Yeah. Care not coddle. That's great. I think about that on a continuum. I definitely want to be over on the care side. That's, that's great, Jordan. Thank you. I was going to ask you about your significant challenges, but you just, you just rattled those off. Yeah. Uh, but note that you have led, you and your team have led key factor to an 11 X growth over the past four years during all of that. So you mentioned your culture as a key part of that. Is there anything else that you would, you would attribute your success to? I mean, I think again, we have a great product market fit. 
we've hired mm-hmm. amazing people into the company. We've got, you know, we've had some good luck because I think our market and the demand for what we do is just mm-hmm. accelerating in growth. So, you know, I can't say it's all like self-created. There's, you know, luck that comes along the way. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think we're all in it together. You know, we're, we're a serious company that doesn't take ourselves too serious. We're an organization that, you know, manages any levels of insecurity and the fact that we're, we treat everyone with respect and, you know, have a very trustworthy work environment. And so it allows people, you know, when you have trust and respect, it allows for vulnerabilities to exist and allows for people Mm -hmm. to put their guards down and really work through the challenging problems that the business is facing as it, as it handles the scale that we've, you know, that we've taken on. So, yeah, I don't know. I think we've done a lot of the right things. We've been proactive about, you know, the expectations of the business we've left behind things that aren't necessary to carry forward you know we talk a lot about innovation we talk a lot about innovation and agility and the way to do that is you know it's not just innovation is not just about building new things it's about not only building new but getting rid of kind of the lagging tail that's not necessary anymore sure. right? so you know you can't you can't hold on to things because of like just you know personal feelings towards it or what, or whatever. And, and so we do a good job, I think of designing a highly objective strategy that's not subjective to, you know, just the past. And, and I think also when we bring people into the company, like we don't do like culture fit interviews because we don't want people to have to fit into our culture. We want people to impact the culture. We want people to change the culture. It's an evolving culture. I don't want, I don't want the culture of key factor a year from now to be the same as today. I don't want to be, I don't, you know, I'm glad today isn't the same as a year ago because everyone has the opportunity to kind of add their own ingredients to what we're doing here. And, and so I think, I think we all just embrace that. And again, we, you know, we have a good time, you know, uh, building this company. It doesn't come without its challenges for sure, but you know, I, I, our team operates very much in lockstep, which is great. Yeah. Terrific. There's, there's no little amount of energy put into alignment, a key factor, as you've grown into to being a, a global organization. Can you talk about some of the activities in the organization that, that help drive that alignment? Yeah, happy to do that. Let me grab some water real quick. Mm. I'll do the same. We, you know, when, when an organization grows and it scales, and we've grown from like 80 people to almost 450 people today in this time frame. You know, what we want is we don't want departments to grow kind of in multiple directions. We, we don't want to create silos inside of our company. We want cross-functional alignment between multiple departments. So instead of growing like this, we talk about growing together and, and keeping kind of that, that tight knit relationship between multiple departments. Now, as we grow, it is natural in, in understanding that you won't have as much information about everything inside of the company because mm-hmm. we've got so much going on. But we do invest heavily in like cross-functional meetups where we have like monthly meetings where our team members will come together on like a big Zoom and then we'll do breakout meetings or breakout rooms, if you will, where they they discuss and, 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 and attack certain challenges that we're facing. And those rooms are designed to be cross-functional. So you'll very rarely see people from your same departments inside of these meetings. We also hold all hands meetings. It used to be monthly. I would certainly be lying if I said it was monthly now, but, you know, every other month or at least once a quarter, we get together as a group and, you know, I provide, I provide material updates to the company so that people could stay in the know. We also have a, a weekly newsletter that goes out. We've got like 16 different departments that are like departments slash sub departments. Mm-hmm. And, you know, instead of having 16 updates a week, what we do is we essentially take four, 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 and four, and, you know, you know, once a week, the whole company gets an update, but it's a monthly update of one of those departments. So we, we kind of stagger that out so people can get, you know, on a weekly basis, digests of about a quarter of the business so that people can just stay current and, uh, you know, be up to speed on, on the important topics that are happening across the company. Yeah. So really putting some processes and tools in place to help continue to foster that sort of communication alignment as the company grows, um, because you're now, you're literally a global, global company, uh, yeah. not, not eight people working in, uh, in Cleveland yeah. anymore. Um, great. So Jordan, just to, to close, cause we're, we're almost out of our time here. The tagline for my consulting business is up and to the right, because that's the spot on the two by two matrix where we always want to be. 
was there a moment in your career when you knew that you were going to be successful when you felt like you're you were moving up into the right you know i, I wouldn't say it's just one moment i mean i think the mm -hmm. biggest thing that i realized pretty early on in my career is that i was pretty i, I was able to self-analyze pretty pretty well and improve iteratively every single day and learn from the good things i do learn from the mistakes i mean i've definitely had a lot of mistakes along this way but you know the biggest thing you know to move up into the right i think it's it's not just one kind of milestone i think it's every day just getting a little bit better at what you do and learning and improving and you know again just being critical of yourself not in a way where it's detrimental but just really having that self-reflection and you know making sure that you know, you're, you're reaching out to peers and mentors and people that work for you to make sure you don't have blind spots and things like that. So, you know, just having, you know, a, a focus on, I mean, even when I was in SDR, I just really thought about, you know, the daily process and how I can improve it. And, and then over time you look back and you're a lot higher up into the right than you were, you know, maybe a year ago or two years ago or three years ago. So I wouldn't say it was one, one event. I would just say it's, you know, just continuing to, to focus on improvement. I've, I've never had the same job twice in my career. So I've always had to, you know, learn new things and it was kind of a trailblazing type mentality. And, and so, so yeah, I mean, I think it's just leveraging your resources and network and, and continually improving on a daily basis is, is kind of what gets you from here to there. I'd okay. say. All right. Thanks so much, Jordan. I uh, really appreciate your time today. Yeah. And uh, we've been here with uh, Jordan Recky, who's the CEO uh, and board member of Key Factor, an identity for security solution for enterprises. Thanks again for joining us and take good care. All right. Thank you, Karen. All right.